competitors are poised to fanfare. There's a bloke with, uh, in high vis with a megaphone having his, uh, having his moment in the sun there. And viewing uh, all of this with a somewhat baleful eye is Graham Smith, who's head of the Republic, which calls for the abolition of the monarchy and the establishment of an elected head of state. So when you see the smiles on all these faces around here, you hear the joy of those people on the Royal Mile. What's not to love? Two-thirds of the population aren't interested in this wedding. A clear majority think that the royal should pay for the security and policing as well as the ceremony. It would appear to be human nature to want a dynasty. This, even the Americans said you got you had the Kennedys, you know, the, the, the Bushes. You almost had the, you had the Clintons. Who knows? There'll be another Trump or other probably getting elected in two years. But the difference between the Kennedys and the Bushes and the Clintons is that they've been elected. But how did this start to you? Did you have a bad experience with the royal when you were five or something? What we're saying here today is that we're not going to get that choice. If the Queen dies tomorrow, um, King Charles is on the throne in an instant, and none of us get a say in that. just been announced from Buckingham Palace that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. and that Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. Listeners will wish us to offer their loyal congratulations to Princess Elizabeth and the royal family on this happy occasion. Prince Charles is a man, I guess, of some sensibility and intelligence, but even he must wake up occasionally and think, the only reason I'm here is because I've passed two tests. The first one is you got born, and the second one is you stayed alive. That's it. It is bizarre. He's Prince of Scotland, Duke of Rothsay, Earl of Carrick, Great Steward of Scotland and Lord of the Isles. I have no idea what the Lord of the Isles does, apart from <coughs> wander around and go isle hopping, I'm guessing. Okay. His mother became Queen in 1952. He immediately became Duke of Cornwall. In 1969, when he was 21, the surplus accumulated for him during his minority was given to him. Five million quid in today's terms from the accumulated surplus, never mind the income he's generated since that. The Duchy of Cornwall is a very, very substantial organisation. It has 132,000 acres, including the Isles of City and the third of Dartmoor. It owns the freehold of Cornwall. It has the right to royal fish. It has the right of wreck. It has the right to appoint vicars in various parishes in Cornwall. They also reckon to own the Isles of City as well. Many Sicilians find it very annoying. Duchy of Cornwall benefits from the fact it's called the Duchy of Cornwall. Clotty cream and scones and beaches and all that kind of stuff. You're beginning to discover that they're oppressive, um, they're threatening, and people are scared of them. So this is a council-maintained road. Yeah. I could take you on some Dutchy maintained roads and you'll shake your bones. Wow. So they don't, they sort of don't put money back into the... They're nothing, they're nothing. Absolutely, just take, take, take. When the son wants to take over the farm, he has to submit a business plan and all that. So if you cause too much trouble, they just say no. Give me off. Wow. We can talk to you on camera about it if you like. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> the 
don't actually own the Isles of Scilly. I mean, there are limited pockets of freehold here on St Mary's, but, and there are the odd freehold property on the off-islands, but the majority of it is ostensibly a duchy estate. You know, it was set up in the time of the Black Prince to provide an income for the heir apparent. If you take that out of the scheme of things, you know, is the general taxpayer then going to pick up the tab for... Um, you know, more, more expense towards the royal family. I, I'm not sure that would go down very well. It was created by Edward III. Now, you need to understand that Edward III had no assurance about his succession. His father had abdicated and been killed. He had to fight to become king. And there was no agreed assumption in those days that the eldest son would inherit from the father. So the Duchy of Cornwall was one way of establishing the succession for Edward III. The duchy as we have it is because of the changes made by Albert and by Victoria. The reality is that the duchy funding the heir to the throne is a convenient way of describing, obfuscating, confusing the cost of the heir to the throne to us. That's the reality because it's a question of policy, it ain't a question of law. It cultivates a convenient mystique. It's a chameleon changing its status to suit its own ends, and it is secretive and unaccountable. Why did I go to Scilly? I absolutely loved it. I walked around the beaches, thought what a beautiful, idyllic place, what a wonderful place to live. And I had a few too many glasses of wine and agreed to manage a cafe for somebody. We had birds there, old parrots at one time, and then we'd never had time to do the parrots, so we just worked the cafe, and then Adam come along and took the cafe on from mm. us and set this up. I kept looking at this area and think, what a waste. So well, I got into rescuing some mammals, we rescued some meerkats from a mobile zoo, and had a really good uh, support for local people. They loved what we were doing especially families with children that could bring them and see the animals. But then, literally, just as we'd finished the bird park and animal sanctuary, we had a letter off the duchy saying we must remove all our mammals immediately. He had young goats, miniature goats, and, well, he had every old sort there. But they didn't have a problem last year when he set it up. They knew he was setting it up. Yeah, well, a duchy say. chap come up here and walked around. Oh, so they saw yeah. all this? Yeah. And then they changed their mind? Yeah. Wow. And when we asked for a reason, they said, you know, we, you know, we don't want to discuss this further. And they would not give us a reason why. With the Crown, there's no negotiation. If they make a decision, that's it. You can't negotiate it because they just don't have to. For the last 20 years, I have actually been pursuing why I cannot enfranchise my property. We've had various acts over the years, the last one in 2002, which gave the right to ordinary people to buy their landlord out, and so they owned the land which their property stood on. So whether you own two houses or one house, or whether you own a thousand houses, the law applies equally across, except when it comes to the duchy, and the duchy exempt themselves from that. There's a famous jurist called Edward Cook, Lord Cook, Lord Edward Cook. He called the Duchy of Mystery. It's been called a strange species of inheritance, and that's by William Blackstone. Our Canaan complex, that was the Law Commission, uh, very peculiar. A medieval anomaly, that was Austin Mitchell. A feudal Roman, that's what I call it. There's a wonderful communist called Royston Green who refers to the Duchy as the notorious institute of royal exploitation. Although the Duchy say they acquired the islands in 1337, there are no records. What is on the garrison is Elizabethan. 
It was the then Ministry of Defence of Elizabeth I who built the castle, who built various houses for ammunition. So it was really a military installation. So how it got from the Crown, i.e. the Ministry of Defence, to the Duchy is very unclear. They've created this myth that they've owned the Isles of Scilly since the time of the Black Prince. Have they? We don't know. It is secretive. People find it intimidating. People on the Isles of Scilly in particular will tell you that, for example, they will go to the Isles of Scilly Council and say, we want to do X. And the Isles of Scilly Council may say no, and they say, well, we're only here out of courtesy, we can do it anyway. The islands, I think, Charles considers as his personal fiefdom. If you decide you'd like to let your house, even have a lodger in your house, uh, the Duchy come along and say, well, we want part of that, thank you very much. They apply what the locals now call a bed tax. So for 14 weeks on a house on the garrison here, the Duchy are taking 1,500 pounds every year just for the permission to let the house. We do survive here by letting uh, second homes out and, and uh, to discourage that is probably not a great, not a great thing, really. The other thing they've done is grant leases for the child's lifetime. And that means that, uh, yes, they can build a house at their expense, but if they die, everything reverts to the duchy. So even if they have children, they have a wife, it all goes to the duchy. It's feudal. Um, I think they think we're almost serfs, and the way they do things and the way they communicate with you um, really belongs to a different era. I know for a fact on silly people won't find the Duchy. They, they won't, because they're worried that the rents will go up faster. It just makes you not want to live there. They are very reluctant to appear or be quoted because they fear there'll be some repercussions. Maybe quite subtly, but repercussions are possible. That could be very damaging to them. And so there is an element of fear, of trust, if you like, which, you know, in terms of the monarch in waiting, is that this is the man we should be respecting. And do you respect people who you don't trust? The present value of the duchy is 877 million. It's, would you believe, the fourth largest landowner in the country? And would you also believe it's one of the biggest house builders in the country? Its income to Prince Charles is 20.5 million. For those of you who actually take a surfing lesson at Watergate Bay, then part of the money goes to the Duchy. Okay, for those of you park in car parks in Polzeth Beach, need I go on? These are significant sources of income. The Duchy's cash flow is really all out of the islands. What comes back uh, is grants, not grants from the Duchy, but grants from the EU, uh, heritage bodies, the house next door, the windows were changed on the front because they were PVC and they were changed to wood. The Duchy didn't pay for that, it was a grant. They own the harbour, they charge all the cruise ship passengers for landing. They take all the pilotage charges. They take all the mooring charges, both for residents and for visitors. Around 16 million pounds has just been spent on the quay, which is owned by the Duchy, 
but the money is actually European money. An example of the Dutch actually investing its own money in the community. <laughs> to be honest, no, I can't. When Prince Charles has come over and he's opened something, the Dutchy made sure that the roads were tarmacked just before he came, but they did really bad jobs. They just tarmacked over really bad roads, and within probably a week or two weeks after the Dutchy had left, the roads were just as bad as they were before. So this is Dutchy Road? Yeah, this is Dutchy Road. He gets even worse around the corner. Yeah. Spends about a million pounds a month on his official duties, but he's still left with around 20 million pounds a year, which I describe as pocket money. And the 20 million allows him to participate in his various vanity projects. I've always thought that some of the Queen's popularity is accounted for by the fact that she's been there so long that she's become a sort of grandmother of the nation. It's put her in a position where even the mildest criticism is treated as a cruel personal attack. But that's all about to change. Even die-hard royalists know that Charles is immature, solipsistic and thin-skinned and wildly overestimates his capabilities. He regards himself as an expert in many fields, from the environment and medicine to architecture and education. Instead of designing an extension to the elegant facade of the National Gallery, which complements it and continues the concept of columns and domes, it looks as if we may be presented with a kind of vast municipal fire station. But what is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. A few years ago, he was listed as co-author of a book called Harmony, A New Way of Looking at Our World. With characteristic modesty, he wrote, for more than 30 years, I've been working to identify the best solutions to the array of deeply entrenched problems we face. Having considered these problems long and hard, my view is that our outlook in the westernized world has become far too firmly framed by a mechanistic approach to science. This approach is entirely based upon the gathering of the results that come from subjecting physical phenomena to scientific experiment. <laughs> it's an absolute mush of highly reactionary um, obscurantist conservatism of the type that believes the world started to go wrong when the harmony of uh, traditional society in the Middle Ages was broken by Galileo. So, you know, in the conflict between the Pope and Galileo, he's on the side of the Pope. The Catholic Church doesn't even hold on to that position. Developers of an exclusive site in the city are blaming the heir to the throne of England, Prince Charles, for the collapse of a high-profile planning application. Clearly what he says is uh, the heir to the throne carries influence. It carries influence with civil servants, it carries influence with government ministers, it carries influence with um, overseas investors. And so clearly uh, his words are weighed heavily. These barracks were due to be transformed, but in June last year, the planning application was dropped. The court heard how Prince Charles had written to the Qatar royal family and their development company, asking them to reconsider the plans, even submitting some new ones with an architect that he preferred. After growing up in an atmosphere of servile flattery, Charles considers himself to be one of the world's great thinkers. All of his ideas on architectural design, class structure, aesthetics and ecology are here. And what he sees as the future looks very much like the past, an 18th century village adapted for the 21st. And that's a convenience store, which I'm very proud of, which everybody said wouldn't work. That's the pub, which again, nobody wanted to touch. But now, of course, the values are going up and up and up. The problem is not the type of interventions that he makes, it's the fact that he makes them. What if we discovered that he was incredibly keen on the death penalty or he wanted to recriminalise re homosexuality? It is absolutely fine, essential even, to defend the Tibetan Buddhist and the Syrian Christian. But 
the people he does defend are always believers in traditional faith. And one notices that that can be combined with the most lush and lavish and friendly relationships with the most powerful and reactionary monarchies in the world. <laughs> He will very happily go to Saudi Arabia and he took part in a, a ceremony with the then Crown Prince and um, they dressed up in Bedouin robes and they took part in a little sword dance. What seemed to me extraordinary about that was that what swords are usually used for in Saudi Arabia is cutting people's heads off and that seemed to me the most extraordinary bad, bad taste. <laughs> And my guess is that he sees them as part of his kind of gang. They're all royals, they're all princes, you know, they, they exist in the same kind of atmosphere, the same kind of world of immense privilege. And he doesn't apply this, he simply doesn't apply the same standards to them as he does to, say, the government of China. Charles is an inveterate and mostly undeclared lobbyist. Over many years, he's used his position to raise a whole series of causes, expecting, and in most cases getting, a respectful response from elected politicians. Good morning, sir. Are you worried about these letters? Are you still writing to ministers letters like that? Have you not been behaving unconstitutionally by letters, writing letters like that? The Guardian fought this case for 10 years, so we saw just a small sample of letters over a period of about eight months, and we could see just how prepared he was to intervene and put pressure on politicians. Britain's Prince Charles said UK troops were under-resourced during the Iraq war, according to a letter he penned to former Prime Minister Tony Blair in 2004. I fear that this is just one more example of where our armed forces are being asked to do an extremely challenging job, particularly in Iraq, without the necessary resources. I remember a friend of mine who became a minister, and he'd only been a minister for three weeks when he got his first letter from Prince Charles. Others range from the scourge of badgers to the plight of the albatross to well, the toothfish. There is a sort of sense that he is a bit eccentric, you know, got all these green obsessions and so on, but on the whole quite harmless. But I think that does a disservice to the rest of us because he does have this extraordinary influence. He is choosing ministers who are relevant to his particular pet issues, whether it's the environment or education or health. Um, he's completely ignored the Treasury whilst we're going through a financial crisis, uh, completely ignored the Justice Department. So clearly he's, uh, you know, meeting ministers so that he can pursue his own political interests. Successive governments fought for 10 years to keep Charles's letters private and it was explicitly said that one of the reasons why the government and the Attorney General kept going to court using a huge amount of public money to try and stop publication was that they said it would it, the letters might give the impression that Charles was not politically impartial. Well, that's cl absolutely clearly what they did do. The Duchy of Cornwall is an aggressive, assertive organisation that intimidates people. And if you take them on, then you will have resources thrown at you which you cannot hope to match. When people like Prince Charles abuse its role, the people they're targeting are in a very exposed position. Because their colleagues are saying the power that monarchy has means that, well, we shouldn't really take, take them on. There have been examples, particularly for a very good and very learned friend of mine, Ed Zardernst. He's certainly been meddling in my life, and he's certainly been meddling in, in uh, health politics, and he's most certainly been meddling in alternative medicine. Nezard is everything a humane scientist should be. And as a proper scientist, he said, well, just because it's alternative medicine doesn't mean it doesn't work. And he went to Exeter University and set up, set up an international um, school uh, to study 
homeopathic medicine, which after all, millions upon millions of people take. It's worth $100 billion a year. When I came to Exeter, I noticed with delight that uh, Prince Charles took an interest uh, in what I was doing. He even asked for a copy of my inaugural lecture, and I was delighted because I thought he was going to support me. Well, Prince Charles has a B under his bonnet about alternative medicine, and he thinks that the NHS should pay for it. But uh, the NHS should pay for what is evidence-based, not for what Prince Charles happens to like. And I think we should investigate it properly. He devised trials, and of course, every single trial, the homeopathic remedies failed. <laughs> Prince Charles had personally charged Christopher Smallwood with doing a cost-benefit analysis of alternative medicine within the NHS. And that was just uh, unbelievable. The methodology was unbelievable. The conclusions were just plainly wrong, didn't at all coincide with my research. So I told him, and... Uh, uh, our emails got more and more stroppy, and finally we fell out. He criticised him. He spoke to a Times reporter criticising him, saying quite rightly the Prince was overstepping his constitutional role. In this interview with the Times, I, I said that um, I fear that he's overstepping his mark in terms of what he's supposed to be doing uh, as, as heir to the throne. On the same day, I got an email from Christopher Smallwood that he would make sure that I would regret that. An official complaint from Charles's office reached my vice-chancellor, uh, and my vice-chancellor started a 13-month investigation into my uh, dealings in this affair. At the end of this, I was pronounced innocent, but all support at Exeter broke down, uh, contracts were discontinued and eventually I had to go into early retirement. He loses his job, his team's broken up and uh, they can't challenge it. They can't say, we, we believe in ac academic freedom, our researchers are paid for by the public and it's precisely to have informed public debate. We have them here at Exeter University. None of that said. He, he doesn't seem to tolerate anybody who has the slightest difference in opinion to his own. I have this romantic, rather naive belief in equality before the law and the fundamental provision that be you ever so high, the law is above you. Apparently those principles apply, except if you're the Duchy of Cornwall and the Duke of Cornwall. The Duchy of Cornwall is and is not. It says it's a private estate, except when it's part of the Crown, and it's part of the Crown when it comes to tax and Crown immunity, but it's a private estate if you want information. The Duchy chooses to be in the private or the public sector, depending on what the question is. There was an issue over an oyster fishery in Cornwall. Somebody called John Druton said the Dutchy should have done an environmental impact assessment before they put in those cages to grow oysters in the river because the Dutchy was in the public sector. John Druton won the case, largely because the Dutchy's representatives said that, um, in their opinion, they were above the law and they could do what they liked. And this didn't go down very well with the tribunal. In the meantime, the Dutchy decided that they had to demonstrate that they were in the private sector by turning St Mary's Harbour into a trust port. Then they wouldn't own the port and they couldn't then be accused of being in the public sector. So the Dutchy appealed, and with the Dutchy solicitors running it, um, Bruton lost. As soon as Bruton lost his case, they gave up any pretense to want to turn the harbour into a trust port. If it suits them to be in one, they'll be in one. 
If it suits them to be in the other, they'll be in the other. The dashi come is a private statement that's beneficial, part of the crime when it's convenient, a trust when convenient and not a trust when not, not a person except when it is, <laughs> was a Department of State but no longer, permitted to break the law and veto acts of Parliament. We're supposed to live in a democracy in this country, and democracy implies that people are actually voted for, and if they don't come up to scratch, they're removed. So it is rather peculiar to have an arrangement whereby those who are head of state and, uh, and those close to the head of state are not elected, but they're by some accident of birth. It's extraordinary in the 21st century that one family can decide what legislation it wants and doesn't want for its own financial interests. These arrangements go back centuries, but they've been amended in the last century to benefit the royal family even more. Go to the National Archive and look at the correspondence between the monarchs and the treasury in terms of paying tax. When it comes to tax avoidance, these people have got it made, I can tell you. The public has estimated the total cost of the monarchy at £334 million every year. That's including security, cost to local councils and lost revenue from the duchess. They don't pay tax, they don't pay corporation tax or capital gains tax. How do they get away with that? It's as shadowy as, as any of those massive multinational corporations who don't pay tax where it's earned. the royal family doesn't pay inheritance tax. The Queen Mother died and should have paid a big inheritance tax bill. None of that was paid. There's a whole lot of voluntary arrangements for income tax, which doesn't apply to anybody else. Why is that the case? When you've got people struggling on very low incomes, the idea that very rich people who happen to be members of the royal family can write the laws themselves effectively or stop laws being passed in order to protect their own interests is frankly indefensible. We've got people in Kensington who can't afford to eat. We're opening our fourth food bank. I don't think we should be paying for the royal family out of people's tax when they can hardly afford to put food on the table. They shouldn't have to do that. It's outrageous that a third of a billion goes to the royal family. It's outrageous that we're going to pay for repairing Buckingham Palace, another third of a billion at least when we won't even have access to all of it. I don't understand the basic inequity of that. How can that be right? It's not right. It's immoral. We now have a situation where it's 12 members of the royal family get free travel on royal duties. So you can debate what a royal duty is. It includes going to a pony club gymkhana and then taking a helicopter to another pony club gymkhana. Whether that's good value for taxpayers' money, we can debate, but they always go by helicopter. The Treasury is supposed to keep an eye on the amount of money that they spend, but of course they don't, because they're frightened. Ministers are frightened, and officials, of course, even more frightened of upsetting them. We love sort of obfuscating these things, because it's too difficult to discuss. And we're worried that one of the tabloids might say we're being unfair on somebody or other. But really needs sorting out because, again, it's feudal ad nauseam. We need to have a proper debate where people can actually speak their minds, look at the evidence, get the freedom of information, information that we need, um, and um, ha have a debate based on facts. The problem with monarchy, which Tom Paine identified, is that sooner or later the hereditary principle will end up with someone wholly unsuited for the job. And it's at least arguable that Charles Windsor is that wholly unsuitable man. He's certainly a monstrous fool. British monarchs are for life, not just for Christmas.
In fact, it's hard to think of anyone less suited by temperament or upbringing to take a major role on the world stage, except Donald Trump. Like Trump, he can't bear criticism, especially from experts. I think the two of them resemble big children who are used to living in an atmosphere where no one dares challenge them. Charles has actually wasted his entire life to get the job that he wants. So I think he's going to be a king in a hurry. And he's made it clear, he's, you know, let it be known, which is, which is how the royals always do it, that he will go on making what he calls interventions, what I call interference. If the Queen were to die next week, he would become monarch at a time of huge chaos, mistrust in politics, doubts about what Britain is, even Britain will survive, who we are, where we are in the world. Everything's just going downhill, it's so bad, a lot of lies, a lot of misconceptions. Where is the person who represents you, who thinks like you? They have these indicative votes and they still can't make up their mind as a why don't and let us leave the EU on time. It's a complete and utter shambles. That is not a time when you were on some bullish, ranting, remarkably stupid man as head of state. We're just committing suicide. I've totally lost faith in democracy. The decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. I just think it ought to be changed. Don't ask me how, but something needs to change. But they never wanted to, they never will do it. They're just going to carry on betraying the boat. It's not going to change. Did you lie to the Queen? Absolutely not. Parliament has the sovereignty, but it's really through the Queen, and we're not citizens, we're subjects. Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! The deep historical divisions that we have in this country are based on inherited privilege, and I think that's perpetuated by a monarchy. Not by the Queen herself, because I respect her very much, but I love the Queen, I hate the monarchy. The Queen is a controversial subject, very controversial, because if maybe if we maybe if we didn't have the queen, we wouldn't have enough tourists. But then again, she did. She doesn't do anything for us. She's the queen of England, so she doesn't do anything for us. She does. She's the queen of England. Even quite monarchist papers like the Daily Mail have run pieces saying this man is dangerous to the monarchy, and the question would be, if Charles turns out to be a really bad king and he's damaging the institution. Who would turn on him? Who would support him? And how would they get out of the problem in the sense that if he didn't agree to go, then they're stuck with him? Is there anything that you can point to in other campaigns that have been really, really successful? Um, and uh, yeah, how to, how, to, how to move things forward? One of the reasons I think Charles is such an opportunity for us is that friends of mine who for years I haven't really talked to about these things because they always say, oh, but the Queen does a marvellous job. When I mentioned Charles, they all got quite annoyed. Uh, and they were saying, oh, Charles, well, that's a very different matter. And so, so that's why I think, I think the atmosphere changes. And I think we need fairly simple slogans because, you know, his tax dodging and all of those kind of things are, are, are very important. But I think it has to be about how out of touch he is and how he lives the lifestyle of a 19th century colonial monarch. After swearing allegiance to the Queen, the prince took his seat on the cross benches, signifying his... Having waited so long, I don't think he'll be able to rein in his, his, his interfering instincts. So I think everything changes when the queen dies and he becomes king. I think all bets are then off. At that point, we would finally have the conversation I've been waiting for all my life, which is why does this country have an unelected head of state and when can we actually move to something more modern? I don't think people would want that. They actually like to have this yes. crap. People no. really know. I'm not saying there'd be a revolution, but they wouldn't have the popularity.
I'm not a radical, I'm not a revolutionary. But the more I've done, the more radicalised I've become, and frankly, the angrier I've become. So much of it is opaque. You know, there are convenient calls behind closed doors. There are convenient conversations. There's pressure to bear, you know, of which we're not aware. Given the cuts that are now having to be made to the national health, to council services, for libraries, for people's care, you must ask, is this fair and is it equal? Unless they behave more openly, um, I can't see people tolerating it. I think there'll be people will turn against the duchy. It ought to be if you're a monarchist, a huge worry. It ought to be your Tom Paine moment if you're a monarchist. Because you then say, well, actually, someone who is wholly unfit to be the constitutional monarch of Britain, and indeed, you know, a good dozen other countries, has finally got here, and we are in trouble. <laughs> 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 <laughs>